Hello. My name is Bob Good. Welcome to the lecture on the science of reincarnation, its ramifications and applications. Many of, us, many of us in this room have formed their opinions about reincarnation based on the education we received when we were younger. We don't include in that personal information base the science that has occurred in the last 30, 20, or even the last 10 years. What we're going to do today is review this science so you can reformulate your opinion about what reincarnation is and how it's being studied, the successes and failures of the science community itself, and the ramifications of this new information. So today we are formally asking the science departments at Princeton, Stanford, the University of Virginia, the University of Miami, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the University of Toronto to accredit two new three-credit undergraduate courses, the Science of Reincarnation and the Applications of the Science of Reincarnation 1.0. You see, the Science of Reincarnation is already being done at these universities, and what they have discovered should be aggregated and taught under one common curriculum so students from each university can see the entire set of discoveries and how they interconnect. So we're going to start by looking at some of the observations scientists are seeing today. And as we go, be aware, I'm going to tell you what the scientists are seeing and what I'm seeing. And together, I want to see if you see the same things that I see. The first place we're going to go is the University of Virginia. They've studied children who claim prior lives. Typically what happens is a child will say, you're not my parents. My parents live 200 years to the north. You're Tom and Alice, and I want to go home. And after listening to your two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old go through this, you finally get disgusted. And you say, fine, let's go. One case of an Indian child, they drove 300 miles to the north. They got to the area she said she was from. She said, turn left, turn right, there's my house. She walked up to the door, and a 42-year-old man answered, and she said, I'm your wife. And he said, my wife died four years ago in, in an accident, and I, I'm, I'm married. She said, who did you marry? And the man told her the name of the woman, and the child's response was, that bitch. <laughs> Two hours later, the man said, that's my wife, or that was my wife. Now, these children who claim prior lives, they can go between gender. You can be a man in one life and a woman in another. You can go trans race, trans religion, but what we're tracking with this data group is two lives. They also have birthmarks. If a child died in a violent event, the new child, the new, the new, the, if the person died in a violent event, the new child being born may have birthmarks that mark the death event like a gunshot wound or a stab wound. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you what scientists are seeing. I wish you could see what James was doing right now. 11-year-old <laughs> James Leininger looks and acts like most boys his age, but beneath his playful spirit is a very deep soul. And I said, you know, I'm really glad you're my son, and I'm, I, I just really fun to have you as my son and he says well he said I know that's why I picked you when we first met Bruce Andrea and James in 2005 his passion for World War II fighter planes was obvious I can beat the Japanese easy as pie the fascination began when he was a toddler the pilot put him on. James seemed intimately familiar with the aircrafts he started doing these little drawings of airplanes shooting that other airplanes are being shot down. Bombing ships, you see men parachuting. Here's another one where planes are dropping bombs. This is a carrier. The violent drawings were followed by extreme night terrors. He would just be crying. He'd say, airplane crash on fire, a little man can't get out. He laid on his back and kicked up at the ceiling, and he goes, Mama, the little man's going like this. And he laid on his back and kicked his feet up. The little man's going, ooh, 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 can't get out. And I said, well, who's the little man, baby? And he goes, me. I thought Bruce and I were just going to faint. They questioned, what kind of plane? Corsair. Why did your airplane crash? My plane was shot down. Who, who shot your plane? He looked at me like I was a, a village idiot. 
He said, The Japanese! Where did he take off from a boat? Do you remember the name of your boat? He said, Natoma. And his name? He always said James. But his name is James. Stunned by his son's words, Bruce tracked down veterans of the USS Natoma Bay. I wanted to disprove it. Columbus, Ohio native Leo Pyatt served on the ship. He asked uh, a few questions about, uh, did I know some of the people? Oh, yeah, I remember those people. Yes, there was a Jim Houston, a rather large shell. He just hit him in the, the engine and it burst into flames and, and went down. It was all real. James Houston, born and raised in the Midwest, was shot down over Chichijima, Japan. He got uh, very uh, quiet. The Liningers were speechless again when James met Natoma Bay veterans and recognized them by name. You're Bob Greenwald. <laughs> I'm serious. He never met Bob Greenwald. No, he never met him before. They tracked down James Houston's sister, Anne. And he goes, uh, it's not Anne, it's Annie. She wasn't my oldest sister. I had an older sister than that. And I said, you did? Who is that? And he goes, Ruth. I mean, Ruth. Eddie is what they called me when I was little. Knowing my name and my sister's name, the things that my brother did when he was a kid. It's too amazing to describe. James recalled his favorite childhood possessions. And when we spoke to them via Skype, they shared one specific story involving James Houston's mother. Annie had sent James the picture that her mother had painted of James Houston. And when James got it, he called Annie to thank her. And he said, where's the one mom painted of you? And so she went and found it and sent a copy. And later on, she told us that no one in the world except her brother and sister knew that there was an identical picture of Annie when she was the same age. Amazing stories like that caught the attention of Japanese filmmakers. All right, what I want you to see in this is the production value. Um, the news media will take an event like this, give you four or five minutes of it, and that's it. The next video is um, going to be Ian Stevenson who was the initial scientist who began studying children who claim past life regression. It was something that Carl Sagan said should be studied because so much was paranormal as opposed to being studied um, scientifically. This is Ian Stevenson before he passed away. I mentioned these universal features that occur in the cases of all cultures so far studied. The very young age of starting to speak is one of them, and then the age of discontinuing the spontaneous references, usually five to seven years. Some children go on longer, and a few even claim to preserve the apparent memories uh, until adulthood. A very high frequency of violent death, it's up around 60 percent in the deceased persons. And there's a very high frequency of mentioning the mode of death Nearly all the children uh, say how they died in the previous life. Then, as examples of uh, features that are not universal, I could mention, um, most importantly, sex change. This, there are many, many cases of uh, claimed sex change in Burma and Thailand. It's even 26% of the Burmese subjects claim to have been a person of the opposite sex in the previous life. Then you've got the birthmark and birth defect cases where you can get some incredible matches where both an entrance wound and an exit wound that, that matches where the previous person was shot and killed. Um, that can certainly make for a very strong case. Now that's Jim Tucker. Jim took over the um, Department of Psychology at uh, University of Virginia um, after Ian Stevenson's death. One of these events is called an anomaly. An anomaly in science is something that our current science can't explain. What happens is, is that the anomalies begin to compound. We, they begin to become databases. This is what the University of Virginia is doing right now in terms of trying to mine this data for similarities and in scientific information. So the children have given a lot of very specific details, and including a lot of names. Um, there's one case in Lebanon that Ian Stevenson investigated where the child came out with 25 
uh, names of people from the previous life, and not just names, but their relationship to the previous person. Now we've got over 2,500 cases registered in our files. Um, what we then do is take all the information from each case, uh, put it in a uh, coding form where we code for 200 variables for each case and then put them in a database. Now, we have children who in Indonesia claim to have been Japanese pilots who were shot down and have a cultural memory of Japan. We have children in England who claim to be German pilots who were shot down during World War II and have a cultural memory in Germany. Now, just recently in the University of Virginia magazine, they uh, featured Ian Stevenson's research and they called it the science of reincarnation. And there were comments on the website that I want to read to you. Chris Becky commented, I'm appalled that pseudoscience such as this is occurring at UVA and also appalled that the University of Virginia magazine would stoop so low as to promote this research as a cover story. Allison said, Chris Becky completely nailed it. I am appalled and disappointed and embarrassed for the institution which has granted me a doctorate in science. But Peter Newton on the same thread said, I'm appalled at those who are appalled. <laughs> they may not accept the quantum mechanic explanation, but the fact of the cases reported can't be made to go away so easily. Have they got a better explanation? Or would they just prefer that we just shut up and hope it goes away? Shades of Galileo and the Inquisition. Now we're not just looking at a database of 2,500, they've culled through 10,000 events such as this and selected 2,500 to put in their computers. But there's a much larger database that needs to be addressed and the researchers today are not doing it and it's because of the resistance that exists out there to doing the research. Um, at UNLV, Raymond Moody did the first research on near-death experiences. There are common themes to all near-death experiences. There are rival stories, I, you know, I died, I saw a light, I came up, I met my relatives. But some of the stories go much deeper based on how long a person is clinically dead. Religion doesn't seem to matter. Moody wanted to know, how could all these people who don't know each other be telling me the same lives? Again, we have two lives tracked. Now the example I want to use here is Pam Reynolds. Pam Reynolds went on, underwent a rare operation to remove a giant bacillar artery aneurysm in her brain that threatened her life. The size and location of the aneurysm, however, precluded its safe removal using the standard neurosurgical techniques. She was referred to a doctor who had pioneered a daring surgical, surgical procedure known as a hypothermic cardiac arrest. It allowed Pam's aneurysm to be excised with reasonable chance of success. This operation is nicknamed the standstill by doctors who performed it and required that Pam's body temperature be lowered to 60 degrees, her heartbeat and breathing stopped, her brain waves flattened, and the blood drained from her head. In everyday terms, she was put to death. After removing the aneurysm, she was restored to life. During the standstill, she experienced a near-death experience, a near-death event. Her remarkably detailed out-of-body observations during her surgery were later verified to be very accurate. The case is considered one of the strongest cases of evidence in near-death event research because of her ability to describe the unique surgical instruments and procedures used and her ability to describe in detail events while she was clinically dead. In short, they brought her out, she recovers, and she describes the instruments the doctors used to operate on her even though she had never seen them prior to the operation. Now the question is becoming, why do these stories from children who re remember past lives to people who have had near-death experiences have the same characteristics? So the database grows. But there's another database that needs to be incorporated into this. And that's what's going on with Brian Weiss at the University of Miami. We have past life regressions where people are hypnotized and they remember prior events. Brian Weiss was a psychiatrist 
And when this began, he was dealing with a person who had clinical pain. It was pain that they couldn't treat medically. So they thought it was psychosomatic and they wanted to go back. And the, the words he used were, let's go back to the point your injury occurred. And the person who was under hypnosis began describing a prior life. There is a ton of past life regressions. The one I want to give you as an example is the one of Glenn Ford. Oh, and before we leave this slide, these past life regressions, there are transgender, trans race, trans religions, people who are regressed, say they're animals in the, in the um, afterlife. When Glenn Ford was approached to do a movie about Dutch psychic Peter Herkos, he decided he wanted to do some research. So in December of 1975, he underwent three past life hypnosis sessions during which he described what appeared to be five lives that he had led. The hypnotized actor was regressed back to childhood and then beyond and described what were presumed to be memories of past lives. In the earliest experience, Ford described himself under questioning as a bachelor music teacher named Charles Stewart of Elgin, Scotland, who died in 1892. Stewart loved horses, but hated his job teaching music to young schoolgirls who he called flibbergibbets. While being questioned about his life as Stewart, Ford agreed to demonstrate his musical skills and played Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Beethoven, even though he could not, as Ford, play the piano. He, he insisted he had never heard of a Scottish town called Elgin, and upon hearing the audio tape of him playing the music, refused to believe that it was he who was playing, swearing he couldn't play a note. To back up these facts, a team of investigators crossed the Atlantic to spend a week in Scotland researching the local history and chronicles of the area in and around Elgin. The researchers found the star's description of the towns, houses, and streets matched what they discovered when they delved back into the local history books. And incredibly, the public census register shows the name of a Charlie Stewart listed as a piano teacher. Further research revealed that Stewart had passed away in 1840s and the investigators found the grave. A second regression attempt was more difficult, this time questioning of the hypnotized actor brought out a French-speaking member of the elite horse cavalry of the 1670s. Ford didn't speak French, but under hypnosis he was able to speak fluent French with a Parisian dialect from the 17th century verified by UCLA. Ford told about his life serving under Louis XIV as a French cavalryman. Now, how do you, how do you be hypnotized and not speak just English but English with a Brooklyn accent. Again, this is an anomaly. Our science cannot explain this. The next one is religion. I am a person of faith. I'm Jewish. And in trying to scientifically absorb and understand what I was seeing, I came across this book, Jewish Tales of Reincarnation. I didn't realize that the Baal Shem Tov, who is a 19th century Jewish scholar, believed that he was reincarnated. This book being looked at as stories from the past actually became a database for me because what was in there lined up with the observations that the scientists are seeing today. And in it, what I really saw was how our forefathers related to seeing the same things I just described. Now, it isn't just stories of reincarnation in one faith. It's stories of reincarnations in all faiths. Um, it is a common human experience. So in a world where half the global population believes in reincarnation, why is it taboo? to study this on a scientific basis. Now, before I go on, I want to tell you about um, the, when, I, when I published my first book, The Science of Reincarnation, I had an uh, editor who was a deacon in a uh, Christian church, and he was anxious to read the book. And after he read it, he said, well, you didn't make your case. He said, because I believe in resurrection. 
But if you look at the stories, the anecdotal stories of the people um, who go through this process, you actually are not judged as much as you are evaluated and you get to negotiate your next life. This, this science supports a human experience. Now, everything I've just told you is an anomaly. They're all anecdotal and they have no scientific value to a scientist. I want to tell you about meteorites. In the 1750s, French farmers came to the French Science Academy and they said, said you see that rock? It fell from the sky. The, the French scientists knew the farmers were lying because you could look at the sky and you could see there were no rocks there. It took 100 years for us to understand the science of meteorites. Now, there are ways to address this body of information. No scientist has done any analysis using odds against chance, a metric for assessing our reality. In the next module, experiments, we're going to see why that should be done. And it should be done right now. Now, part of it's already being done, but let's look at some of the experiments. University of Toronto. J. Norman Everson was the professor emeritus in archaeology. And in 1972, there was a bit of a kerfuffle at the archaeologists' meeting. This is what he said. It is my conviction I have received knowledge about archaeological artifacts and archaeological sites from a psychic informant who relates this information to me without any evidence of the conscious use of reasoning. By means of the intuitive and parapsychological, a whole new vista of man and his past stands ready to be grasped. Now, Emerson's specialty was Ontario Iroquois Indians. And he said this at the end of his career. He put his reputation, his position in the scientist community, on, in the science community, on the line to take this position. Now, the way Emerson would work was he would work with a psychic. In this case, he was working with George McMullen, who was a garage mechanic. Emerson would give McMullen an artifact, like a glay pipe or a, sh a shard of a bowl. Such artifacts are known as lithics. McMullen would turn them over in his hand and he would tell Emerson about them. It's about the size of my glass case. As Emerson said when he was delivering his paper, McMullen's accuracy ran to about 80%. A typical example of how they would work together would be that Emerson would give McMullen a pipe stem. McMullen would describe roughly when it was made, how it was used, what Indian group used it, and where it was found. But one day, a man by the name of Jack Miller brought him something made of black stone, about two-thirds the size of an average man's palm, flat on both sides. It was generally agreed between Miller and Emerson that the stone was argolite, which is a shale-like rock about the hardness of soapstone found on the Queen Charlotte Islands off the coast of British Columbia, and used in prehistoric and historic times as carving material. Miller told Emerson that he knew where the stone had been found. At the bottom of a post hole, he had excavated at a site near the town of Skidgate on the Queen Charlotte Islands, and the time period in which it had been worked. Later that evening, Miller gave this piece to McMullen. The stone Mullen stated with a certitude possibly only to one totally ignorant of the intellectual information on the subject was carved by a black man from Port-au-Prince in the Caribbean, from whence he had brought it to Canada as a slave. Emerson was appalled. As he later admitted, here I just presented a paper on how good George was, and he was saying something that was patently ridiculous. There were no black men historically on Port Charlotte Island from this time period. McMullen just wasn't wrong. He was completely wrong. It turns out it wasn't McMullen who was wrong. It was the archaeologists who were wrong. Two years later, a team of physical anthropologists totally unconnected with Emerson went to British Columbia to do blood analysis work on the Indians in the area. Their report, when filed, contained what was for them a disturbing observation that in an area where no blacks were supposed to have been until modern times, one tribe showed unmistakable evidence of a black forebearer. The tribe in question was the one to which Emerson's psychic team had said the escaped African had married. 
This, therefore, is physical DNA corroboration that a black man had lived in the tribe at that time. This is something that passes as admissible in a court of law. So we have DNA proof that this is true. The next experiment I'm going to tell you about is at Princeton University. And if you think we're wandering away from the topic of reincarnation, what we're actually explaining is the science of it, and we're breaking it down into its component parts of mind and body. The intention experiments began at Princeton University and were headed by Robert John and Brenda Dunn. These experiments involved programming a computer to produce randomly an equal number of zeros and ones every hour. Every hour there would be 50% zeros and 50% ones. The computer was then connected to a screen that would show two different pictures, for example, a boat and a tree. This is what the researcher's subjects, average people recruited off the seat would see, street would see when they came to, to be the test subjects. People would sit in front of a screen and John and Dunn would ask them to make one picture appear more than the other. People could close their eyes and say tree, 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 or they could talk to the computer out loud. They were not allowed to touch the computer, so the only way they could affect the computer was by their intent their thoughts. Here are the results. Virtually everybody could make one picture appear larger, or pick, appear more than the other by a margin of 52 to 48 percent. If a bonded couple, a man and a woman, sat in front of a computer and did it jointly, the researchers found that the computer would produce 54 percent of one picture and 46 percent of another. If two women, however, sat down together to attempt the experiment, they could get the same 54, 46% result, but sometimes in the wrong direction. While I don't want to over-editorialize here, my older son says that makes sense to him. What I'd like to do now is, oh, by the way, this, this project ran for 25 years, and through a quarter of a million dollars, uh, through a quarter of a million trials of different people, and was validated by other labs doing the same type of work. I'd like to show you the video of Brenda Dunn. Go through the scientific process of peer review and et cetera, et cetera, if you can't have peers, if you're not allowed to present the data and you're not allowed to deal with it critically on a rational scientific level. So you end up getting irresponsible criticism. You end up getting um, uh, unreasonable rejection not on the basis of the quality of the work but on the topical matter uh, in my view that's not science that's not what science is about science is about opening your mind to learn something new it's not saying this is something I don't want to hear about this is the sort of thing as one critic said I wouldn't believe in even if it was true and, and that is the kind of response you get um, this is one more piece to the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Study. So can people affect objects and machines with their minds? It would appear they can. The phenomena are real. Uh, they aren't just due to chance effects. They're small, uh, but those small effects comp compound over many, many occurrences. They don't seem to be associated with processes that we think of as cognitive. We don't see things like learning curves. We don't see any of the usual things associated with cognitive, perceptual psychology. We know that they tend to appear uh, more a beginner's luck effect or serious position effect, where people tend to do better the first time. We notice that the, they seem to be distributed across the entire distributions of the outputs. It's as if uh, the probabilities are being changed rather than the physical activity. Um, we've seen these cooperator effects where people of opposite sex or and especially people of opposite sex who are bonded couples are resonant with each other tend to get stronger effects than individuals. The field reg data have shown us that we get effects when we're in groups of people in environments where there are a lot of people who are on the same wavelength. Uh, we have seen gender differences. Males and females, on average, produce different characteristics in their data. 
Uh, they are independent of distance and time. Uh, all of these things, of course, are challenging uh, any attempts to model them because these, these things just don't fit with our, our prevailing understanding of the way the world works. Compounding the results across all of our experiments, all of the time we've been operating, you then come out saying that the results you find in this composite database are unlikely by chance to better than one part in 10 to the 12th. That's one part in a trillion. This is far more stringent than any science experiment I'm aware of requires for its validation. One of the central tenets of quantum physics is that subatomic entities can behave as either particles, precise things with a set location in space, or waves, diffuse unbounded regions of influence which can flow through and interfere with other waves. What John and Dunn began to chew over was the idea that consciousness has a similar duality. Each individual consciousness has its own particular separateness but was also capable of wave-like behavior which could flow through any barrier or distance to exchange information or interact with the physical world. All of you have experienced this. You sit here listening to me and you've got particular consciousness. You are fixed in time and space listening to me. But every one of you at some point has had a feeling that my sister just was in an auto accident. I hope my children are okay. There, there is that second sense that you access in what John and Dunn are connecting a physics theory to your experience. At certain times, subatomic consciousness would get in resonance with or beat with the same fre frequency as certain subatomic matter. In the model they began to assemble, consciousness atoms combined with ordinary atoms, say those of the computer, and create a consciousness molecule in which the whole was different from its component parts. The original atoms would each surrender their individual entities to a single larger, more complex entity. On the most basic level, their theory was saying that you and the computer develop coherence. Dean Radden in The Conscious Universe wrote, just as a photon is a particle and a wave, perhaps consciousness has complementary states. In ordinary states, the mind is more particle-like and is firmly localized in space and time. This is supported by the ordinary subjective experience of being an isolated, independent creature. But unusual, non-ordinary states of awareness, our minds may become more wave-like and no longer localized in time and space. As with particle-wave duality, it is not the case that only one or the other is true but that both are true simultaneously. So these experiments feed from one another. If we could influence a machine, could we influence a biological entity? You've all heard about the power of prayer. It's being taken into the lab and it's being dissected. In the 1960s, biologist um, Bernard Grad of McGill University in Montreal used plants which he planned to make ill by soaking their seeds in salty water, which retards growth. Before he soaked the seeds, however, he had a healer lay a hand on one container of salt water, which, to be, which was to be used for one batch of seeds. The other container of salt water, which had not been exposed to the healer, would hold the remainder of the seeds. After the seeds were soaked in the two containers of salt water, the batch exposed to the water treated by the healer grew taller than the other batch. Grad moved on to mice who had been given skin wounds in the laboratory. He found the skin of his test mice healed more quickly when healers treated it. Grad also showed that healers could reduce the growth of cancerous tumors in lab animals. Perhaps the most impressive study was carried out by Randolph Bird in 1988. He had attempted to determine in a randomized double-blind trial whether remote prayer could have any effect on coronary care patients. What he found was those who had been prayed for had significantly less severe symptoms and fewer instances of pneumonia and also required less assistance on a ventilator and fewer antibiotics than the patients who hadn't been prayed for. 
So if you pray for something to happen, then you intend or wish for it to happen, whether you're praying to Jesus, Jesus, Buddha, or to Spider Woman. Well, Spider Woman is a, uh, an American Indian grandmother type figure. You're still positively affecting the object of your interest. These studies were all a preamble to the study that Elizabeth Targ and Fred, Fred Tischer did. Elizabeth and her partner selected a population of advanced AIDS patients. They tried to match the two groups, the target group and the control group, so that they will equal in their degree of illness, the same T cell counts, and the same number of AIDS-related symptoms. All healing would be done remotely. By the end of the study, she saw her patients with end-stage AIDS getting better. During the six months of the trial, 40% of the, pop of the control population died. But all 10 of the patients in the healing group were not only still alive, but becoming healthier on the basis of their own reports and medical evaluations. At the end of the study, the patients were examined by a team of scientists, and their condition yielded one inescapable conclusion. The treatment was working. It still led to some questions because there were criticisms of that study. First, because it flew against conventional wisdom, but they wanted a larger group, more studies. A year later, their results were vindicated when a study entitled the Mid-America Heart Institute on the Effects of Remote Intercessory Prayer for Hospitalized Cardiac Patients showed that patients had fewer adverse effects in a shorter hospital stay if they were prayed for. Neither TARG nor the MAHI study demonstrated that God himself answered prayers or even that he exists. We have observed that when individuals outside the hospital speak or think the first names of hospitalized patients with an attitude of prayer, the latter appear to have a better CCU experience. In fact, Elizabeth's study, in Elizabeth's study, it didn't seem to matter what method you use. It didn't matter who you prayed to either. If your intention, if you believed in your intention, it seemed to have a result. They examined the modus operandi of the healers. And that suggested the mo most outlandish idea of all, that individual consciousness doesn't die. Indeed, one of the first serious laboratory studies of a group of mediums by the University of Arizona seemed to validate the idea that consciousness, consciousness lives on after we die. In studies carefully controlled to eliminate cheating or fraud, the mediums were typically able to produce more than 80 pieces of information about deceased relatives, from names and personal oddities to the detailed information about their deaths. Overall, the mediums achieved an accuracy rate of 83%. One was even right 93% of the time. A control group of non-mediums was right on average only 36% of the time. In one case, a medium was able to recite the prayer a deceased mother used to recite for one of the sitters as a child. As Professor Gary Schwartz, who led the team, said, the most parsimonious explanation is that the mediums are in direct communication with the deceased. What we think we just proved there was the sinking of wavelength and the proof of prayer efficacy. This kind of information the government gets their hands on. And that happened at Stanford University between the period of 1972 to 1995. Russell Targ co-founded the Stanford Research Institute and with funding of $25 million from the CIA, DIA, NASA, Navy, Air Force, and Army Intelligence, Targ had this to say, that he doesn't believe in ESP. Instead, he has seen ESP occur in our laboratory on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, he has written a two-page article entitled why, I'm, why I Am Absolutely Convinced of the Reality of Psychic Abilities and Why You Should Too. A couple of points from his paper. In 1972, Pat Price successfully looking, looked into and described an NSA cryptographic site in Virginia. Pat named the site and read code words from the files. This was confirmed by both the NSA and the CIA. Okay, do you understand what I just said? They took a guy named Pat Price and they put him in a room 
in Stanford, and they said, we want you to look inside of Langley. Not only do we want you to look inside of Langley, we want you to look in their file room, and we want you to read the files. That's when the CIA started to fund it, because he did it. They came, they came to Pat, and they came to Russell Targ, and they said, how did you get this information? And when he told them, they wanted more studies done. In 1974, Ingo Swan, another one of the psychics used, described a failed Chinese atom bomb test for the CIA from geographic coordinates. He drew it with colored pencils showing the line of trucks and the pyrotechnic display of the failed test. But he did this three days before the test failed. In 1978, Joe McGonigal located a downed Soviet backfire bomber who'd crashed in Africa with code books on board. He psychically pinpointed the African site. President Carter confirmed the success of this operation. Now, do you think the US government has stopped this program after the successes they had? Or did it simply go dark? And it wasn't that the Stanford work was unique, because in World War II, um, the Brits did their research at Bletchley Park, and they were using sensitives to try and get information on the uh, Germans. Now, Dean Radden, who heads the Noetic, Noetic Institute at Palo Alto, California, said to me that the fact that the human ability has the ability to reach outside the mind is now proven to 10 to the 27th power. You heard Robert John say it was proven to 1 in a trillion, 10 to the 11th power. The difference between the two numbers is because when Radden crunches his numbers, he's using a larger database than the one Robert John was using. Robert John was using just his work at Princeton, where Radden was looking at all the work done at Stanford and other locations. Fact. Non-local consciousness is now considered a fact that your mind can reach outside your body by the researchers at every institution that I just mentioned and you looked at. So how does that relate to our bodies? I'm sure you're already familiar with the fact that your body regenerates. I just want to look and take a look at how dramatic that process is. Your stomach lining is replaced every day. You replace your skin every two weeks. The molecules and atoms in your bones are replaced every year. Even the enamel in your teeth is totally replaced every two years. Your body that existed three years ago is gone, and yet you still remember what chocolate ice cream tastes like. Your memories from 40 years ago are still there. So which is more permanent, your consciousness or your body? We're not talking about speculation here. We're talking about fact. In essence, if you're 50 years old, you've already reincarnated 25 times. So where are our minds? Where is memory stored? What scientists wanted to do is find the grandmother cell, that cell in your body that remembered your grandmother. Over 30 years ago, neuropsychologist Carl Lashley worked at the Yerkes Laboratory of Primate Biology when it was located in Orange Park, Florida. Lashley trained rats to run a maze. He tested their performance, and then he surgically removed portions of their brains and tested them again. His aim was literally to cut out their memory. Where was it? Which section of the rat's brain remembered the maze? He reasoned that ultimately he would burn out the part of the brain that housed the memory. To his surprise, he found out no matter what portion of the brain he cut out, he could not eradicate the memories. Often the rat's motor skills were impaired and they stumbled clumsily through the maze. But even when massive portions of their brains were the, removed, their memories were still intact. Carl Prib Pibram, Pribram was a young neurosurgery resident who worked with him. If memories possess specific locations in the brain the same way that books possess specific location on library shelves, why didn't Lashley's surgical plunderings have any effect on him? For Pibram, the only answer was that memories were not localized in specific brain sites. And in the mid-1960s, he read a Scientific American art article describing the first hologram. Now, holography exists thanks to a phenomenon called interference. Interference is the crisscrossing pattern that occurs when two or more waves, such as waves of water, ripple through each other. 
For instance, if you drop a pebble in a pond, it will produce a series of concentric waves that expand outward. If you drop two pebbles in a pond, you will get two sets of waves that expand and pass through one another. The complex arrangement of crests and troughs that result from such a collision is known as an interference pattern. Laser light is an extremely pure, coherent form of life. It's especially good at creating interference patterns. It provides, in effect, in essence, the perfect pebble. A hologram is produced when a single laser light is split into separate beams. The first beam is bounced off the object to be photographed. The second beam is allowed to collide with the reflected light of the first. When this happens, they create an interference pattern, which is then recorded on a piece of film. There is, however, another fascinating trait about holographic films. If a piece of holographic film containing an image of an apple is cut in half and then illuminated by a laser, each half is still found to contain the entire image of the apple. You can cut that piece of film down smaller and smaller, and each piece of that film will contain the entire image. If it was possible for every portion of a piece of holographic film to contain the image information necessary to create the whole, then it seemed equally possible for every part of the brain to contain all the information necessary to recall the whole memory. So have we seen this kind of thing on, at a macro level? In 1988, Claire Sylvia received a heart and double lung transplant. Following the operation, she underwent some apparently personality changes. She began to have unusual for her cravings for beer, green peppers, and chicken nuggets. She dreamt about beautiful women and experienced homosexual urges. She also dreamt of meetings with a young man called Tim. Alarmed, Sylvia thought out, sought out her donor's family and discovered her new organs belonged to an 18-year-old boy. His name was Tim. Tim had a penchant for the same food she was craving, he was actually eating chicken nuggets when he died, and Sylvia felt he was the boy in her dreams. So what does this show? Your memory is stored holographically through your entire body. Your mind must be able to access your memory, so your mind must be able to operate through your entire body. But there needs to be a dual theory. If mind and memory are diffuse wave patterns, then there has to be theory for how they interact with our bodies on a macro level. It appears that on the quantum level, there's no sophisticated theory to incorporate the energy in your body into biology. We measure electromagnetic, pulse, electromagnetic pulses of the heart in an electrocardiogram. We're improving brain scans. But the energy patterns of the body itself are only at the very early stages of being mapped. And these energy pulses that create the same kind of interference patterns are the ones you see in a hologram. So what we found is that memories are a waveform. Memories are permanent to our consciousness, but not our body. And so our current science indicates that consciousness is not reliant on the body. It can occupy the body and reach outside of it. That once outside the body, it's still discrete. That once outside the body, it's still directed. This is our current truth our current reality according to science. Now, we're 50 minutes into this, and I'm told we should have a break. So why don't you take uh, 10, 10 minutes, and we'll reconvene here for the last three modules.